Hello everyone, today is Thursday, October 22nd, 2015. This is your update. This is your update. This is the week in charts. Well, there's a disclaimer screen. I know I say this every week, but you can lose money trading. Oh, before we do that, uh, this week's Dave Landry's The Week in Charts is brought to you by Webinar Soon. There's a webinar. Soon. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. What can we talk about? Well, I want to talk about how to factor in the news to your trading. I want to talk about trend trading when there is no trend. And is the bear out or back in the woods? So I think uh, that will all make a lot of sense in a few minutes. Rather than tell you what I want to tell you, I'd rather just tell you. Robert says, it seems that the methodology could be enhanced at times, i.e., when you're trying to catch new trends. And when, and you were not simply a trend following moron, by considering additional information. Like, for example, if China continues to decline, there's no way that metal slash commodity slash commodity stocks can begin to establish a solid new trend. This is probably my fault, of course, is I need to filter out what trades I want to take from your recommendations. The concept of ignoring all information. Other than all information, other than other than price, in all circumstances, does not sit does not sit well with me. Okay, so what about the situation in Nigeria? I know I've still told the story a dozen times, but it's just such a such a valid point. I was speaking at Traders Expo. Oh, I don't know, probably a dozen years ago, or at least uh, ten years ago. In New York City, and um, I was talking about how I was bearish. I think I was bearish on the oil stocks at the time. And someone blurted out, what about the situation in Nigeria? And they sounded kind of like uh, Henry Kissinger. And I'm like, what about the situation in Nigeria? And evidently, Nigeria was going to cut off the oil, or Venezuela was going to cut off the oil, or something like that. But it had something to do with Nigeria. And, you know, so now it's, what about the situation in China? Well, my good friend Greg Morris does a presentation where he puts up a chart and he lists all the things that have happened in the chart. And I just I was emailing Greg right before this, and we, I didn't have a chance to put up his chart, but I decided just to make it my own. So here's some of the events from 2015. We had the Russia attacks. On Syria and the Syria civil war, Greece bailout, I forget, did they bail out or not? They rejected it or something like that. We had Ebola and then we had Ebola and then later on we had Ebola. Uh, we had the Fed throughout the year. And now China, as mentioned, Windows 10 was announced. There was a new iPhone. Actually, there was a new iPhone every two weeks. So far, we had three earnings periods every quarter. So we had at least three earnings periods. Uh, there was an Iran nuclear deal, Nepal, Nepal earthquake. Uh, they found liquid on Mars, and, and they left Matt Damon on Mars. So all this happened so far in 2015. I think you'd be hard-pressed to pick all that out in this chart. Some of them might be a little obvious, but uh, I certainly don't know where and what happened and when. There's always a reason not to take action or to bail out on existing positions. The problem that you have when you start factoring all these things is I think you can end up with analysis paralysis. And here's the other thing I was thinking about. It's not what you know that usually whacks you. We knew there was a situation in Greece and we do all these other things that are happening. But all of a sudden you get whacked or blindsided by something that you never saw coming. So that's one of the problems with factoring in the news. Now, let's say if you only traded when things were 100% rosy, you would never make a trade. So even back in 1999, there was no good reason to be long. The valuations were ridiculous. Buying stocks was a stupid thing to do. But what did stocks do? Stocks went straight up. And those who confuse the issue with facts, they either missed the boat. There were a lot of fund managers 
that completely missed the boat. Certainly the value guys missed the boat because the valuations were too high. And then there were a lot of people who decided that they were going to short the market in spite of it going straight up because their reason was very solid and very sound. And that's how I got the name Trend Falling Moron. Not because I was short the market. I was just saying, hey, let me just draw this big blue arrow on my chart. Blue because that's what the paint program defaulted to. And said, hey, it looks like it's going up. Let's buy stocks. And then people confuse the issue with the facts. One in particular. And call me a trend following moron. And at the time, I wasn't very happy about that. But... After a while, the name stuck, and I got the T-shirts made, and I got the hat made, and the cards made, and the <laughs> bought the domain, and uh, the whole nine yards. So keep in mind that logic doesn't often apply. I know the media tries to connect the dots. And what else are they going to do? You know, they're going to, as I said before, they're going to get up and say, well, uh, supply exceeded demand today, so stocks went up. And then tomorrow they say, well, demand, um, I'm sorry, supply, did I get that backwards? Demand exceeded supply today, so stocks went up. Or supply exceeded demand today, so stocks went down. I mean, that, that would be the news brief. That would be it. That would be the news. That'd be it. So logic doesn't often apply. Now, the media tries to connect the dots. They have to do something. What are they going to do all day? What are they going to do for eight hours a day? they got to do something or 10 hours or however long. So just remember that logic doesn't often apply. And I've told all these stories so many times. I'm not going to tell them again. But just to kind of paraphrase Tom McClellan's mother, Marion, she said people buy or sell stocks when they have money or need money. And she also said that some uh, – other people often use more sophisticated methods. So never forget there's people behind the bars, and you're dealing with the emotions of those people, and logic doesn't always apply. And then the other question that Robert sent me was, Dave, if there is no trend and we are trend following more odds, why are we trading and losing money? Well, it's a good question, Robert. First of all, we get paid to take risk. And risk is being risk being the key word in that sentence. As I said before, you want comfort by, if you want comfort, buy a comforter. If you want a guarantee, then you buy a toaster. And seriously, some of the best trades come in spite of adversity, the contra news type of trades. The market's going up in spite of the news. The market's going up in spite of the ridiculous valuations. For you commodity guys out there, you get the contra seasonal trade. Seasonally, Soybean should be going up or whatever should be going down, but it does just the opposite. And never forget, there's always something to worry about. Now, this got me to thinking. The market hasn't really gone anywhere in over a year. You could depends on what time of day it is. It's actually negative year over year. So this got me thinking this morning. Let's take a look at some winners in spite of the market. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details in each one of these. And a lot of these charts I had left over from earlier this year, so I just pulled up, threw them into the presentation. But you can see this was an IPO, first pullback at IPO, very great pattern to trade. And then it took off from there. And this is a transitional pattern at a Chinese stock. And it bottomed out very nicely in here, nice little base, began to take off a little bit, kind of, not exactly a bow tie, but kind of a first thrust, also kind of a cup and handle type of pattern. And then it took off nicely from there. Uh, this is the mining stock. Another, Again, another transitional pattern. You can see first thrust off of lows, a little bit of a pullback after a long extended base. Nice little takeoff in there. That was back in April. And then this is uh, another stock that made a transition off of lows, nice little rally off of lows. First little pullback here, and then it took off from there. Another type of transitional pattern, nice little bow tie, kind of cup and handily looking. Nice little bottoming pattern, as you can see. Triple bottoms, if you want to call it that. Nice thrust from lows, also a first thrust. Little pullback, it begins to resume 
it begins to resume its uptrend. Little uh, IPO pattern here, uh, double top knockout, which is not an IPO pattern, just classic Dave Landry pattern. But nice thrust higher, little consolidation, nice little knockout move, and nice move higher. And one more, this is uh, what I kind of call a sort of an IPO Phoenix type of strategy. The IPO comes public. It just kind of dies. They get their act together, and it begins to take off again. You look to play a pullback when that occurs. And then here's another one, a uh, nice little uh, accelerated move higher, a little bit of a TKO, and then the stock takes off from there. And then yet another transitional pattern. This is an oil overall. This is a USO. Double bottom, kind of a bow tie looking, a little thrust from lows, kind of cup and handle looking. And then it took off from lows. And this is one that was left over from last year that stopped out this year. And you can see we had, I think this might have been an IPO back here, accelerated uptrend and a pullback. Okay. And then I think we already showed this one, but this is a bow tie, obviously, thrust higher, a little pullback, also kind of cup and handle looking. And, yeah, there's been a loser or two. And this is a slide that I just showed last week at Traders Expo. I got up in front of everybody and said, I'm going to show you something you're not going to see over the next three days. I'm going to show you something that you've probably never seen a guy get up on stage show. And that is a losing trade. And, yeah, it, it happens, spelled with a silent S-H. So, occasionally, we do have some losing trades. Overall, though, there's been some really great opportunities. And that's what I want to kind of build the case on this year in spite of the market. So, I took... I took the winners from the year, and I put them on the chart. And you can see the chart hasn't been that great. And after a while, you can say, well, geez, Dave, it's all over the place. Why would you be buying and selling stocks? Well, we're going to get into that in just one second. But you can see that all of these winners we just looked at were inarguably not a great market conditions. And truth be told, I, I kind of hate that saying, but for lack of better words, if somebody would have showed me this chart and said, hey, um, if you forgot every trade you made, it's like, would you want to be trading or not? It's, oh, definitely not, because you could draw pretty much a sideways arrow for the whole year. Now, this doesn't mean that you always want to be trading in less than ideal conditions. Notice that since the middle of July, we've only had three trades. Now, let's take a look at that further. So here's some thoughts on trading in less than ideal conditions. You want to listen to the database. And you're going to get some decent trades. And admittedly, you're going to have some losers too in spite of adverse conditions. In an ideal world, you do want the market to be headed higher. You do want the sector to be headed higher. And then you want the individual stock to be headed higher. And ideally, because since we're talking ideals, you want other stocks within the sector also headed higher. Okay. Sometimes you don't get that, and sometimes you just have to listen to the database. If the database is producing setups, then you trade. What has the database done over the last few months? Not much, okay? Three trades in three months is not a lot of trading. So as you would imagine, a lot of the time over the past three months, we've been sitting on our hands. Now, the question Robert says is why are we trading ourselves into the hole? Well, I think three trades in three months is not trading yourself in the hole like a madman, like I'm trading, I'm trading, I'm trading, I'm trading, okay? It's just three trades in three months. It's not that active. Obviously, we're mostly sitting on our hands, and we're not really trading that much. Now, we did have one loss over the last three months, and we have two open trades. Now, two of those open trades are losers. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. A few minutes ago, one of those just went back into the profitable column. So now we have one loser open and one winner open and one recent loss over the last three months. Here's the thing. When you look at the open portfolio, you got to be careful. You got to think about things long term. You're in this for the long term. Would you make a trade or two or three? Those are going to be one or two, three or three trades that you're going to make over your entire career. It might be one of thousands or, or three of thousands, I should say, that you will make over your entire career. We get paid to put capital into harm's way, and sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it does, okay? Now, as long as a position is open, I don't claim victory or defeat. 
because I think you can waste a lot of mental energy in the process. Yes, I still drop F-bobs, and yes, I still get pissed off. But in hindsight, I probably got a little too emotion when I really didn't need to. Okay, so I'm working on that. I'm working to get better at that. Nobody's perfect, right? But I try not to get too excited about open positions, especially when they're losing positions, until I know the eventual outcome. So I'm sure this gentleman was a little upset. He's got a couple losing positions in his portfolio. But worrying about them doesn't help. In fact, you end up wasting a lot of mental energy. And like I just said, one of them a few minutes ago just went back into the positive column. Now, do I know if it's going to end as a positive or will it have a positive outcome overall? I don't know. So I try not to get too excited when trades are losing. And I try not, conversely, I try not to get too excited when there's winners in the portfolio. And I don't claim victory, so to speak, unless the stock has at least hit the initial profit target. And a lot of times I'll recommend a stock. It'll go up a point or two the same day. Not, not all the time, obviously, but sometimes. And I'll get emails from people. Hey, Dave, thanks for that stock. It's like, well, let's not start kissing each other just yet. Let's see how it all plays out before we get too excited about that. So don't focus too much on the short term. You need to see a trade, again, as one of hundreds or thousands of trades that you will make in your career. Now, here's the thing. There will be blood. If I could solve for that, you'd never see my fat ass again. I remember way back in the, in the 90s when I started programming mechanical systems. One of my first profitable systems, I said, aha, I got a little bit of an edge here. Figured out how to buy these markets and sell short these markets. So I've got some profitable trades in here. It looks like it works overall. Now I just need to build a filter. That will filter out all of the bad trades. And we all know what that is. That's a holy grail. And that just simply does not exist. Okay. And I did spend many years trying to find it. Sometimes you're the fly and sometimes you're the windshield. So you will get beat up a little bit in this game. That's one thing that I can guarantee. And it kind of reminds me of, of, of bullfighting, of the, of the of, you know, I'm not going to tell it's a Cajun joke because you guys wouldn't understand my, my Cajun accent. But, you know, Boudreaux goes to the, to the bullfight and uh, he goes to have supper at the clubhouse. And he looks over to the left of him and this gentleman is eating this um, couple of meatballs, a lot of spaghetti. It just looks fantastic. Boudreaux says, I think I want that for supper. And the waiter says, oh, sir, I'm so sorry. Uh, there's only one per day. Uh, after the bullfight, uh, we killed the bull. The, or the bull, you know, he goes on to the, explain the details of uh, what that meal was. So Boudreaux says, well, put me down for tomorrow night. So the next night, Boudreaux comes in, and he gets served these two little tiny meatballs. And he calls the waiter over. He says, hey, what the heck? And the waiter's like, oh, sorry, sir. Sometimes the bull, he wins. So... <laughs> Sometimes you're the bull, sometimes you're bullfighter, and sometimes those two roles change. All right. Great chart. Also, the U.S. has has only been at peace for a total of 21 years since its inception. That's interesting, Jesse. We're gonna, I'm going to have to write that down. Since its inception, the U.S. has only been at peace for 21 years. I guess that's 20, is that 20, it can't be, is that 21 consecutive years or 21 years total? Because that's kind of an that's an interesting piece of information. Total, wow! All right, I'm going to write that down. Um, a few weeks ago, I showed you a mystery stock, which I thought would be kind of a fun thing to do. And this was straight out of my Landry list. Had a little uh, gradual uptrend, acceleration, and uptrend, and then a little bit of a pullback. So I'm going to reveal what stock that was. And that was APDN for those keeping score. Now, it's not to rub salt in anyone's wounds that missed it, but I think it's a good teaching explanation of what a good stock looks like. As I've said before, counterfeit currency detectives don't become good at what they do 
by studying a bunch of crappy bills. They don't look at Monopoly money and go, yeah, 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 that's fake. Uh, that, that orange, that orange little note there, that, that $500 bill that's orange, that's fake. No, they look at real dollar bills and real $100 bills and real U.S. currency. And they study it very carefully and learn what makes that bill. And then the fakes are just blatant and obvious. So study charts that look like this. And then when you see crappy charts, you'll know it. Okay. Any questions or anything? Global X has a Nigeria ETF. Yeah, Michael, what's the uh, symbol on that? We'll, we'll plot that just for SGs in a few minutes. Um, I've plotted it before. I'll make a note of that. Oh, I can look it up when we get to the charts. No big deal. All right, the question is, are we out of the woods or back into the woods with the bear, whatever the phrase may be? And I don't know. I think it's too early to start kissing each other just yet. When we get to the actual charts, the live charts, I want to pick out a few things in the charts or, or point out a few things, I should say, that we've been talking about uh, ad nauseum lately. And I don't think we're, we're done yet. Now, I know we're having a good day today, but uh, day ain't over? No. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to focus too much on the micro, but as I've been saying, we've got a weekly bow tie. This is a weekly chart, and I know I've been saying this in nausea, but I think it pays to pay attention. We had one in 2007, and it was early 2008, I think, when it actually triggered. And we have one way back in 2000, believe it or not, even on a weekly basis. And the weekly chart is obviously going to be a lot slower to turn than the daily chart. But even on a weekly chart, the turn, even as gradual as it did, as it has been, is enough to still capture a significant move after the signal. Now, maybe this time is different. Maybe this time it won't work. And you can maybe argue that, well, statistically, we don't have enough uh, sample to be statistically valid. And maybe that's true. But we had a bow tie up in 2000 and the market rallied significantly. We had one. In 2009, it was a little late to the party, but the market, I don't know, more than doubled since. So I think it pays to pay attention to these signals. And even if you just pay attention to the order of the moving averages and the slope of the moving averages, look at the run from 94 all the way to 2000. So I think it pays to pay attention. Now, you're going to have some lag, but even with the lag in these signals, it's going to help to keep you on the right side of the market, or at the least – Maybe have you a little bit cautious, maybe pulling your horns a little bit, okay, when things are a little bit iffy in here. Now, a couple of random thoughts before we jump into the charts. And this is something I think about a lot. Anytime I hit a drawdown, I see people give up, obviously. And, oh, heck, I, you know, I get bummed out too, okay? I still have a pulse. But anytime I ever hit a drawdown – People begin to quit, and then they go off to chase rainbows. Now, it's not my way or highway. There are many ways to skin a cat, and there are many ways to trade markets. I don't necessarily agree with all these other methods, but if you found something you like and you're successful, I guess that's a key word. That's it. It's successful. Then do it, okay? But don't quit a viable methodology at the first signs of adversity. If you do, you will never become successful as a trader. Again, it doesn't have to be my way. It's not my way or the highway. But I see it happen all the time, and it kind of bums me out. And I guess if I didn't care and just say, well, we'll just flip, we'll just be a flipper when it comes to uh, clients on the educational side and not worry about it, like a lot of these scumbags out there do, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me, and, and I guess we'd probably do – a lot better the educational side because we just would seek out a bunch of new clients um, and, and don't care about them. But I'd like to build something longer term and something lasting where we go through the good times and the bad times, but mostly good times longer term or do well longer term, I should say. Obviously, no guarantees with any methodology, okay? But as a general statement, with any viable methodology, you have to stay with it longer term. Dave, how long is longer term? Well, it depends. In my particular case, I would say six to eight months and occasionally longer. 
go back to that S&P chart, and we've had a whole year of just kind of chopping around all over the place. And somehow, we did okay during that period. I can't guarantee you it'll always work when the market looks like that. But that's got me excited because if we were able to do that well during that period, we didn't set the world on fire, okay? could always be better. But somehow we survived that ugly, ugly market. So it has me very much looking forward to what's going to happen when the market trends again, okay? But it does take time to capture momentum cycles, even though we're kind of in that short to intermediate term time frame where we actually take profits, hopefully, on swing trades and then hanging around for a longer term ride. But even though we have a bit of a short term method, uh, mentality, it does take time to capture trends. And it does help if that market is in a rip roaring uptrend or even a rip roaring downtrend, I guess, would also work too on the short side. So, again, as I showed the chart before, don't quit at the first signs of adversity. My best clients are those who come in doing crappy times, and I somehow convince them to stick with it, and then all of a sudden the market begins to trend again. And then they're like, hey, Dave, I'm glad I stuck with this. Now I get it, but I'll tell you this, next time market gets choppy, I'm not going to freak out. I'm just going to live through it. It kind of tippers their expectations. The worst thing has happened, as I've showed before, Somebody started like right after a drawdown and the market just went straight up. It was the most persistent, beautiful uptrend we've seen in many years. And literally at the peak of the market, I got an email, bravo for your system. And then the market started chopping sideways. He told me it's the best thing he's ever seen. He's never made so much money. He went on and on and on and on. And then three months later, the same guy pretty much, <laughs> to put it nicely, told me that I sucked. Well, market started chopping around. So those people who start doing less than ideal conditions, they see some great conditions, their expectations are tippled. And that goes for any methodology. I'm not going to sit here and explain all the other methodologies. I'll let everybody else do that. But there's a saying in the South, the sun doesn't shine on the same dog's ass every day. At different times, different methodologies are going to work better in the market. Oh, but Dave, why don't we just switch methodologies? Well, I don't want to get into that too much, but you could end up perpetually out of phase. I see that happen all the time. As soon as you think, okay, well, I'm going to start trading this mean reversion system, the market takes off and wipes you out. Okay. So I think you have to find something that works for you, something that makes sense for you. And the secret is, there is a secret, is stick with it. I think the other secret is patience. And sometimes you only get three trades in three months. And when those three trades started to losing trades, or two out of three are losers at this point, you can't give up because you had three losing trades. You gotta you gotta tough it out. Okay. Now but tough it out just means honor your stops and then if you have the sit on your hands, sit on your hands. Uh, human nature never changes. I like to kind of be listen to the man on the street and pay attention to what's happening. I when I go to a cocktail party or something and uh Last cocktail party I went to, somebody told me they're getting out of break even. And that is a microcosm of what is out there. I think that's the mentality. We've had this permanent income type of market since 2009 for the most part. There's, a, there's been some bumps along the way. But the market has taught you since 2009, and the market can be a bad teacher, by the way. But the market has taught you to hang on. No matter what, since 2009, the buy and hold people have been rewarded and rewarded nicely. And I think a lot of people in more recent times have probably got to thinking before this bill, you know, this market is just going up. I better get on. And those people are going to be the last on. The people who are the last on are often the first out. So I think that human nature never changes based on this little microcosm of talking to the uh, man on the street. In some cases, literally the man on the street. People stop me sometimes when I go out for a walk. Um, don't get caught up in retrace rallies. I think so far we just had a big retrace rally. Uh, we did have some short-term buy signals recently, but that I'm not going to rush out and buy a market when it has a mountain of overhead su a supply right above where we are now where people are looking to get out of break-even. So I'd be really careful about that. Now, 
speaking of being careful, you do want to pick your spots carefully. I'm still seeing a lot of metals and mining and energy stocks setting up, but we'll take a look at that in just a few seconds. But they're not triggering lately, okay? So if they don't trigger over the next several days, I could easily see where these things could probably just roll right back over and go back to making new lows, and we go back to sitting on our hands. So you do want to pick your spots carefully. Um, again, sometimes that means, you know, the waiting on the dock thing. I left this in from a few weeks ago. Better to be on the dock, wishing you were out to sea, or out to sea, than out to sea, wishing you were on the dock. And as my airline pilot, Fritz, tell me, better to be on the ground, wishing you in the air, than be in the air, wishing you on the ground. So that's a little bit more of a reality. Um, I left this in from a couple weeks ago. I'm not seeing a whole lot of shorts right now, by the way. It doesn't mean the market is still in trouble, but I'm not seeing as many shorts as I had been lately. And then if you do short, uh, pick the stocks that are at high levels, just beginning to roll over versus those that are in modified downtrends. Jesse says, come on, Dave. <laughs> you can't control the market. <laughs> can't you control the market? <laughs> Michael says, very good uh, paper or backtesting trading, more difficult than at first glance. Valid, good paper or backtesting. What's good, valid, good paper? What does that mean? Or backtesting trading is more difficult than at first glance. Yeah, you start backtesting and things look pretty damn good. Well, you got to realize it's, it's in hindsight, you know. And sometimes what you have found might just be an aberration. I know I've said this before. But if someone showed me two systems, and one of the system, one system printed money, and one system was a little bit more mediocre, I'd be willing to bet that that system that's a little bit more mediocre would continue to work in the future, and you could actually probably trade it as a viable edge. And the one that printed money more than likely is an aberration. And if you think about it, if it printed money, it fit the curves of the past. Write that down. I think that's. I think there's. I think I'm backing into something here. If it printed money and you got a system, I think it fit the curves of the past. And think about that because let's think about the stock chart as the curves. Okay, curves up, curves down. And if you had a system that caught every zig and zag or 90% of every zig and zag, then it's possible that system was an aberration. OK, it's not to say that the mediocre system is going to continue to work or be a great system. Again, hindsight's 2020. But I think that perfect system in hindsight will likely stop working. And I think we've we've all seen this before. If you've been around the industry enough and, you know, unfortunately, and I'm not being uh, what's the word schadenfreude or feeling schadenfreude, the German word for taking pleasure in other people's pain. But I've seen people over the years with some great look at systems. And then when they go to put them into practice, they either blow up or they end up with less than ideal results. And it's 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 horrible to see these people go through the process because <laughs> they a lot of them actually go out and raise money and everything, and they show all these hypotheticals. And then when they go to do it, it just plain old plain old doesn't work. Okay. Now this is not to say don't do back testing, don't look for edges. Absolutely, you should you should look for edges. I don't back test anymore. It's been a few years since I've programmed something. But I'm always empirically looking for some sort of edge and empirically trying to figure out the markets, meaning I'm looking at charts, trying to figure it all out. So do back tests, but just know that the caveat is the hindsight is 2020. And I've seen it all over the years. I had I was involved with a hedge fund once and a third party came in, put us two, me and another guy together. And he looked at every little tick for years and years and years of the market. He thought he had a system. And he had rules upon rules upon rules that every time something would happen, he'd make a rule. Well, all that was in hindsight. So I don't want to get too far into that. I might get in trouble. Uh, but anyway, um, wasn't there a system called aberration? There was. There was a system called aberration uh, back in my futures trading days. And they used to post that at Futures Magazine, which um, I actually met the guy, not, not to uh, get too sidetracked, but I actually met the guy who bought out Futures Magazine, and it's now called Modern Trader. I haven't read it yet, uh, but I was looking at uh, – I was kind of glancing over a sample issue uh, recently, 
and uh, it looks like it's going to be pretty interesting. In fact, there's a couple articles in there I'd like to read. So uh, I, though uh, I haven't written for them, I think I've written for Futures before. I don't remember. Uh, I think I've written for every magazine. Uh, <laughs> right now I've been writing a lot for Traders, which is a, a German publication, and it's also published in English and uh, several other languages. But anyway, a uh, nice gentleman from um, Modern Trader who recently bought out Futures Magazine. So uh, I don't get anything for, for promoting that, but you might want to check that out. But uh, yeah, back at Futures before I digress too far, there was a system called Aberration. It did fairly well. I don't know what's happened since. Maybe some Googling. I'll let you know. All right, uh, just a couple announcements this week. Um, I put in podcasting yesterday, and I think this is something I'm going to work on from now on to make happen. My columns I know can get a little lengthy, and some people are uh, – on the go, so I decided to add podcast. I uh, submitted it to Apple, uh, and it's pending. I had a podcast many years ago, and so I just resubmitted this again, so I'm sure they'll let me in. But uh, if you just want the audio from the column, you can get it off of uh, my website, davelandrycom slash podcast. Uh, new this week, well, it's not new this week, but it's been on a few weeks, but I did add a new this week to the website, and I'm working to keep the uh, – content very current there as you know okay any questions anything we talked about so far before we hop into the uh charts if you have turkeys you have bears you think we have bears because we have turkeys i don't know you know what i don't understand is why did they put the bear crossing sign on the highway like on some of the busiest highways can't they put that crossing somewhere else i mean can't those bears you know why don't they put the bear crossing like on, a, on an old uh, highway that nobody goes down, but they put that bear crossing right in the middle of a busy highway. I mean, that's just, you know, every now and then you see a bear get whacked up. I thought you only drank dew, Mr. Landry. <laughs> well, my, you know, my wife had forgotten to buy the dew for a couple of weeks, and then uh, I guess that was earlier when I said I was going to go grab a cup of water. My wife forgot to buy the dew for a few weeks, and then I kind of, uh, I guess I kind of broke the cycle from it, so... I can't imagine that that uh, fluorescent, or as the Cajuns say, fluorescent, <laughs> fluorescent green is good for you. Um, DavidDaveLander.com is my email if you got any other questions that you don't uh, want to ask here if you're watching the um, thing. Let's see, just mumbo jumbo opinions. Alex, I don't see any education. Oh, there's lots of education. I have tons of educations. Alex says he doesn't see the education. I have 1,400 YouTube's uh, opinions. No, uh, I teach the whole methodology. So, yeah, pay attention. All right, let's uh, hop into the charts. USO not performing as well as oil stocks in up market. Well, USO, that's the weird thing about commodities. It could be a little perverse, okay? So we'll take a look at that now that we're looking at the markets. Um, and you can start asking about individual stocks now if you want. Uh, notice that USO took off back here, okay? And that was what, uh, August, what was that date on that? Took off on August 24th and ran up 27%. Okay, that's nothing to sneeze at. Let's take a look at the overall market. And let's take a look at what happened on August 24th. Do, 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 do. 24th. Okay, that was the bottom of the market. But it went down. The market actually went down during a period where the USO went up 30%. So uh, you're saying that USO is underperforming oil stocks. Yeah, sometimes you have that lead and lag. Sometimes oil stocks begin to take off, and then lo and behold, oil follows. Sometimes oil takes off, and lo and behold, the oil stocks follow. And sometimes one goes up, and then the other goes to go up, and then they both roll back over. And that's markets. Okay. Now, let's take a look at the um, the P's. We're having a good day so far. Okay. One thing that's had me concerned with the P's is we're just kind of crawling higher in here. And then, uh, Alex, pay attention. You might learn something. I am teaching something here. This is an area of what's called resistance or overhead supply. 
in this area, there's likely a lot of people who have bought stocks. You see, each little bar is a day's worth of trading. So for months and months and months and months and months, there's people that have likely bought stock in this area. And now we're pushing into this area. So the market will likely have a hard time getting through that area. Now, that's not an opinion. That's just that's education. OK, that's reading the charts. Can the market go through that area? Absolutely. The market can do whatever it wants. OK. The day you realize that, in spite of your opinion, is the day that the true enlightenment comes. You realize that, hey, the market can do whatever it wants. I like this pattern. I like this setup. I like this trend. I have some confirmation in the sector, the setup. I'm sorry, the sector, the overall market. It's, it's a good setup. It trades cleanly. It does all those things that Big Dave has taught me. But you know what? I better put a stop in because Big Dave says it could also be wrong too. And the market could still do whatever it wants. All right, we'll get to that, David. Thanks for the kind words. All right, let's take a look at the comp. Oh, by the way, S&P 500. Let's take a look at the weekly here. Let me just, I applied the weekly bow ties. By the way, you have a daily bow tie up. But I don't, I don't pay much attention to transitional setups at high levels. Yeah, if this was 2008, 2009, and we're making a bow tie up after the market's dropped 50%, then that's more important to me than it's making a bow tie up off of these high levels. Yes, it's a short-term bottom, okay? And a short-term bottom could turn to a long-term bottom. But again, we've got a lot of overhead supply. Let's take a look at the weekly bow tie here. And I wonder if I can make these a little darker easily. Oops, nope, I fat fingered it. Let's try that again so you can see it. So let me just make these bars wide or whatever the, the moving averages. All right, here we go. Now you should be able to see it. So if we go to a weekly chart, oops, we go to a weekly chart, you can see that the moving averages have crossed over and turned down. And again, what happened last time they crossed up? Big bull market, last time they crossed down. Big bear market, last time they crossed up. Big bull market. And then before that, as you know, big bear market. Okay. Will it work this time? I don't know. But. Like Greg Morris says, I've been telling Greg, like I told Greg this morning, hey, I'm going to quote you today. He's like, uh, he goes, I'm retired. You could uh, make it your own now. <laughs> but I like what he says so much. He says a lot of good stuff. And one thing he says is we treat every signal as if it would be the big one. And that's back when he was running billions and billions of dollars. So we treat every signal as if it will be the big one. You take all signals seriously, Okay. Doesn't mean the market's going to go down so far. It's going back up since the signal. I had a little bit of a, a zag down, and now it's kind of going back up. Okay? Maybe rather it would. I hope we are. I hope it doesn't work. Okay? Alex has left the building. See you, Alex. Hey, we can talk about Alex now. <laughs> uh, some people get it. Some people don't. You know, it's like, I don't care. I just have fun in the process. He says, wow, thanks for support and resistance education. Well, tell me what you want to know, Alex. I'll be happy to teach you. Great presentation today. What do you think about UA on the pullback? All right, we'll take a look at that. Uh, before we do that, let's take a look at some of these areas in here. So far, um, maybe we could uh, go to Alex's presentation next week. Uh, so far, just get you a GoToWebinar account and, and you're in business. Um, so far, a lot of these areas like drugs, as you, as you can see, have still rolled over. It still looked like they're in a lot of trouble. What scares me is if you back the chart way, way out, you can see longer term, they look like they're in a lot of trouble still. Okay. And this could just be the beginning of something much bigger. Doesn't mean they're going to drop and lose 50% of their value. But again, I guess they need to make it my own. You have to treat all signals or take all signals seriously. Okay. And so far, Drugs have rolled over. And if you're just looking at things on a net-net basis, this is what sometimes people forget to do. And this is why I love the little 
C key in uh, Telechart for custom sort. Um, I like to put the sort on and just not actually run the sort so I could see what the move was. And you could see market's down 17%, market being drugs at least, since, oh, roughly three months. That's a pretty serious slide for something like drugs for a sector, okay? Uh, one thing I was looking at yesterday, it's kind of like I've been telling everybody over and over, it just looks like a big retrace to me. Let's not get too excited about a new uptrend developing. And admittedly, you take a look at something like PCBs, and it's like, well, wait a minute, Dave. That looks pretty serious. It's like, I know, but let's not get too excited until, until it starts banging out new all-time highs. And look what happened to PCBs yesterday, okay? Absolutely imploded. It looks like we're getting a little follow-through already today. There. Now, I know it's just a few symbols in here that are doing this, but if it's taking the whole sector down, I think it pays to pay attention. Selected software uh, has also begin, uh, been getting whacked in here, too. And so far, I know it's worked its way quite a bit higher, speaking of software, but you can see so far, that still looks like it's in trouble, too. Uh, health services, uh, we're short MOH, FYI. Here, uh, you can see so far, thrust, and then choppy, choppy pullback, and then thrust, and then choppy, choppy pullback. And now, put a question mark over here, it looks like it's making another thrust lower. So the point I'm trying to make here is a lot of sectors still look like they are in a lot of trouble. And just, I'm picking a random sector here, M and C, material construction. Not that long ago, it was breaking out to all-time highs. It broke out to all-time highs. That was a mother of all fakeouts. And then, as you can see, it's imploded since. Margin call. <laughs> now, for the most part, most areas, again, look like they're in trouble. And so far, have just kind of retraced back up towards their old highs. Kind of like the overall market itself. Let's take a look at the rusty before I forget. Boy, that phone is loud. Got to figure out a way to turn that down. I'm right here at the desk. Uh, Rusty sort of uh, sideways in here, kind of a short-term double, double bottom. It looks okay, shorter term, but sometimes I think you have to see the forest for the trees. If you back the chart way out on the Rusty, going all the way back to 2013, so far, this looks like a big picture top in here. Now, as I've been telling everyone ad nauseum, for me to get bullish, the market would have to make new highs at this juncture. Now, check back tomorrow and check back the next day, etc. But as a trend follower, I'm okay with giving up part of the trend, waiting for a trend to follow. And again, even though Alex already knows this, <laughs> it's so funny. It's like, you're not teaching me anything. It's like, okay, well, this is overhead supply. Well, I know that. It's like, well, how the hell am I supposed to know what you know, what you don't know? Anyway. Because we have all that overhead supply, until we get through that, I'm going to have a hard time getting excited about this market. And it's an area that will likely cause some resistance. Okay, So I think I've kind of beat the dead horse enough in the sectors. Just a couple more things I want to point out real quick. Some of these areas like tobacco are begging on new highs, but tobacco is more of a defensive issue. People still smoke in a bear market. So I kind of see this as more of a negative than a positive. It's not a huge negative. I mean, obviously it's going up, so you got to, you know, kind of take the good with the bad here and kind of weigh it all out. But I'd be more excited if drugs and biotech and semiconductors and some of these other areas were begging out new highs. Brokerages, I like to see brokerages make new highs. We're making new highs. That would make me feel a lot better about the overall market. Now, I still like the energies and I still like the metals and mining. They're just taking their own sweet time. They made a nice thrust from lows. In fact, energy stocks here uh, took off, and they did They did a 20% run. Remember, what did USO do? Let's put a comparison in here since we have a little time today. I think I'm talking too fast. That's probably why we have time. Let's put in USO as a comparison symbol because uh, somebody was pointing out that the lead to lag between those two a second ago. So let's do this. Let's put in uh, USO. It's hard. My windows are opening or hiding. Okay, here we go. USO, what color y'all want that? I will make it uh, like a cyan or something. Okay, and, and let's make it visible. Come on. USO. Okay, and then there we go. There it is. 
Okay, somebody pointed out that USO the, was underperforming the oil stocks. And you can see, now keep in mind, this is not the scale, but this is the USO, which is the underlying commodity, okay? And you can see that it took off back here, so did all stocks. It kind of went sideways in here. And what did all stocks do? They, they sold off hard. And then the all stocks took off, and so did the USO. And now we're seeing another divergent. I wouldn't get too caught up in the details of all this. But, yes, do pay attention to the underlying commodity and do pay attention to the stocks. We are long USO, by the way. Metals and mining, another area I think still has potential in here. So far, big picture cup and handle. Um, and so far, a bow tie. But zoom the chart in a little bit. And as you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, almost 10 days where we're consolidating in here. So that's two weeks worth of trading. Sometimes markets do take a little while to digest their, their gains, and that's a 22% run for the stocks in metals and mining. So that's a pretty big run over a short period of time. So I think it's normal for it to consolidate a little bit. I still think a bottom is in place, but make sure you're waiting for entries if you're going after some of the stocks here, okay? <laughs> Jesse says, fade Alex. Oh, I'm such, you know, I was told uh, – Somebody told me recently, you gotta, you just gotta ignore these people that are being douchey. But it's, it's not my nature. <laughs> I can't help myself. I wish I could. Uh, for persistent bears, what's for persistent bears? Uh, I'm definitely not a persistent bear, by the way. Uh, we're looking to get long a stock right now. We're looking to get. In fact, I think I have three potential longs right now coming in today. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and open things up for general questions, and I'll get rid of these. Uh, uh, not get rid of. I'll take these other questions in the meantime. Okay, the question is on UA. Uh, David says, uh, great presentation today. Thank you, David. Uh, what do you think about UA on a pullback? Uh, I'm going to say no. And the reason I'm going to say no is because, well, first of all, look at today's action. It's beginning to kind of implode in here. It's off 8% off of new highs. Now, um, I wish Alex was here because this is a teaching moment. <laughs> When a stock makes a new high, everybody's happy, okay? Everybody's happy who owns the stock. That's a fact, okay? Because everybody who owns a stock up until the little guy who bought it right at the peak is making money, okay? So you got a stock at new highs like this. You know, let's say somebody bought it at 30 bucks a share way back here in 2013 or 20 bucks a share. They have tremendous profits, okay? But once a stock begins to drop, these people begin losing money, and then that becomes the aforementioned overhead supply, okay? So I would be careful on this one. Also, let's take a look. Let's go back to August. So what's that? August, September, October, November. Kind of reminds me of like the Monday, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday. So it's three months, and the stock has dropped 10% in three months. So that is not a trend. Yes, if you back the chart way out, you could say, Dave, look at that big blue arrow. Well, hang on. Dave, look at that big blue arrow, or big cyan arrow in this case. And I, I can't argue with the fact that it's still an uptrend, but I'm thinking that the trend may be turning. And take a look at the moving averages in here too, okay? Now, they're, they're rushing to catch up with the price, and that's a great thing about exponential moving averages. They will turn, again, something I learned from Greg. Uh, they will turn as soon as the price goes through it. So that's why you have this big turn down in price today. But I'm not seeing much of a new trend to catch. Now, let's go back to the – let me just show you what we're looking for as a pullback player. Um, and I'll just pick a random chart here. I kind of want to get to that APDN, but let me just see if we can get to it. Here you go. This is This will work, okay? As a pullback player, you really want to see a stock – oops – you really want to see a stock that looks like this. You really want to see a stock that's ideally headed higher and ideally, I'm sorry, headed higher and ideally accelerating higher. And then you want to see a pullback like that. You don't want to see a stock run up and then do this. And then in this case, UA like that. You want to see something that's still in a serious uptrend and just sort of correcting that uptrend. Okay, I know I beat the dead horse in this one, but I wanted to give you, some, uh, based on your question, I want to give you a full answer. 
Suds on Saturday night. Suds. S U D S. I can go for some suds right now. SPX has a confluence of your resistance with 200 day moving average. Thank you, Howard. That's um that's a that's a good point. Um one thing about technical analysis, and I used to joke with a fellow trader about this. It's like the Cajun joke about the thermos keeping the hot things hot and the cold things cold. Uh, how do it know? And a lot of times, technical analysis, you wonder how do it know? A lot of technicals come together at the same point, and that's why earlier I said it's not my way or highway. You're going to be surprised. The more technical analysis you study, the more you're going to realize – that it can all be boiled down to a few simple things. And a lot of technicals, if you are using a variety of technicals, you're going to find that they all come together right around the same point. Where's the 200-day moving average? 2025, okay? Where is the overhead supply? Eh, 2025, 2050, whatever, round numbers, close enough for government work. So a lot of times that 200-day moving average is going to be right at that longer-term resistance. And that's just how it all shakes out. And it's kind of interesting. I was talking with um, – I don't want to name drop, but let's just say it's a famous option guy. I spent a lot of time last week with him, and um, he was telling me about somebody's system. And it was a very, very complex system, but he, he was trying to explain to him, you know, if you just boil it all down, you're just uh, you're just doing this. I mean, I don't know what the exact thing he said. I don't remember, but it's probably you're just trading breakouts or you're just trading pullbacks or, you know, you boil it all down. So – and that's the thing. Yeah, learn about all these great and wonderful technical techniques, but just pick the few. Just pick the few that make sense to you and use them. And don't try to use too much stuff. And my point is that a lot of the stuff is going to confirm anyway. And don't look at three different things and say, oh, all three things can confirm, so this must be the top or the bottom, whatever. Just pick a few things and stick with those. And again, a lot of the technicals will come together. So yeah, good point there, Howard. Uh, resistance at the 200, a resistance at resistance. Okay, good point. Alex is missing a lot of good information here. <laughs> okay, Barr says, in your long-term chart, since the range from the bottom to mid-level is approximately the same as the mid-level to the recent high, also indicate the market can be tired. Thanks. Okay, I'm not fully sure I understand that. Let's take a look at, uh, okay, in the long-term chart, since your range for the bottom to the, what bottom? From the 2009 bottom or a more recent bottom? Okay. Uh, I, I kind of think he's talking about from this bottom up is equal to uh, this level down. Okay, round numbers. This from here to here and here to here. Does that indicate it's tired? Well, I think if you look at things on a net net basis, and you realize that this is a weekly chart, you go all the way back to 2013 or late 2014, I should say. And you can see that the market really hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress since then. So it's like the arrow now points sideways. Whereas if you back the chart way out, you can see that the big arrow pointed up for a long, long time. Yeah, a couple of corrections along the way, which shook me out. It also got me short and then spit me out. And the buy and hold people are like, you see, you just hold on. It always comes back. But, well, unfortunately, it doesn't always come back. Okay. Oh, from 2009, okay, to the mid-range. Yeah, I mean, sure, it could always do a 50% retracement. I'm not a big fan of retracements, but they do occur, and they do happen, obviously. So if we put that on a chart, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, look at the run here, and if this market starts making retracements, I think this is a 50% right here. Uh, that's certainly plausible, and that's certainly, certainly possible, okay? You can have deep retracements. So, yeah, I agree with you on that. I think we're, I think we're on the same page. Versus 2020, 2015, the mid-range. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. APDN. Oh, you want to look at that one now? Let's take a look at that one now. Okay. APDN for Andre. How's things in New York? Um, I'm not as big a fan of it now because you've kind of got this double pullback in here. 
if you're long, stay long. But I think I wouldn't look to get into it at this point. It would actually have to make new highs. You're welcome, Bars. Uh, it would actually have to make new highs before I get excited. Do you consider volume at all? When do you consider volume at all? Never. Okay. I answer this question quite often. I probably need to put a, a fact page on my website. Again, if you can find a useful volume, then by all means use it. Um, I think uh, I like Richard Orms. Uh, Dick Orms had some good um, good information on uh, on volume. He's a former uh, a fellow member, not a former member, fellow member of the AAPTA. And um, I know Dick, and he's got some good research on volume. Uh, he, he does an ease of movement, meaning that if, uh, if prices go up and volume is light, that's actually bullish. And a lot of people would think just the opposite. So I'm not a fan of volume. I know some people that use it, such as Dick, and, and have been successful with it. Uh, but I'm not a big fan of it. And then now you've got dark pools, so-called dark pools, and now you've got high-frequency trading. Uh, to me, I think you have to be a price purist. When you make a trade, you agree on volume. You're not agreeing on – I'm sorry, you agree on price. Okay, hopefully that weather for slip. slip. You agree on price. You're not agreeing on the volume. You're not agreeing on, agreeing on the book to earning ratio or the PE or whatever. You're agreeing on the price. So why not just study price and be a price purist? And your life gets a lot of easy, a lot easier once you do. Okay. Uh, RJ says thanks for the education. What MAs are you using? Um, I like to use what I call my bow tie moving averages. I like to use a 10-day simple, a 20-day exponential, and a 30-day exponential. And then just for good measure, or, or just to kind of give me a, a reference point, I should say, I like to throw in a 50-day simple just because it's well watched. And sometimes the inflection point of the of the moving averages going into that 50, the, the bow tie moving averages, like right here, you can't really see it because of the scaling is, uh, is too much. But when you back the chart out a little bit, when you get the scaling right, when you have a fairly sharp angle into the 50, that could be uh, a significant change in trend, and that's something to keep an eye on out for, okay? Are you familiar with order flow systems, Dave? I know what they are. I don't use them, okay? Uh, Roberta says no sound. Sometimes a squirrel will, will get his nuts caught in the wires, there's a lot of wires between me and you. The good news is these are being recorded, and uh, I will uh, publish the recording to YouTube, okay? Order flow system is market profile is. Uh, market market profile, I don't use market profile, but um, I think there's something valid there. I think if that's something you want to study, then then it's viable. Um it, it, somebody said something about volume, and I did experiment. I did experiment a while back, and I haven't used it recently because I haven't really used my StockCharts.com account in a while. But I used to have a, I used to look at a lot of charts at StockCharts.com, and I've kind of just not intentionally, I've kind of grown away from that. Uh, but what I was doing for a while, which was kind of fun, was I was plotting volume by price, which puts the volume bars on the side. And I think there's something there, but it's kind of like all technicals come together. So you've got a big mountain of uh, overhead resistance or overhead supply, and then you got a volume by price bar on the side. So let me show you what that looks like real quick since we have a little time today. I could just draw on the screen, I guess. So ignore the chart for a second. Um, so this – Volume by price looks a lot like market profile. So if you had volume by price, and you'd, you'd have these bars on the chart that look like this, and then you might have something that looks like that. And if you take a look at something like the S&P, and I haven't looked at it with the volume by price on there, but the chart will look like this. And let's say we're right here right now. Well, you say, oh, look at this. This is going to be resistance. Well, guess what? Just look at the chart. And that's resistance, okay? So there's definitely something there with volume by price. I think if you had to use volume, either use Dick Arms method or use volume by price. Those are two things that make a little bit of sense to me. Um, and again, I, I, I do kind of like that volume by price. And the volume by price is going to look a lot like market profile, okay? Uh, there's just one of me, and I'm not going to look at everything in the world. I, I found my little niche. 
so to speak. And I don't I don't get too far out of that little niche. Every now and then I'll experiment with some things, and then I'll come right back to it. Okay, uh, right back to my simple trend following stuff. Okay. All right. Let me get the let me get back to the charts. Andre wants to know about C E N T A. Uh, yeah, it looks good. At first glance, uh, this is a food company, and as I said earlier, the stocks that are doing really well now tend to be defensive in nature. People still eat in bear markets. People still smoke in bear markets. Uh, usually people still take drugs. I guess some people take more in bear markets, but the drugs aren't doing too well. But a lot of these areas that are rallying in here are defensive in nature. I did a, a column a while back, and I referenced it recently. Uh, you could just type the word rats, I guess, into my uh, search bar on my website and um, how rats leave a ship. And since we, we have plenty of time today, I could show you that real quick. And my point is that a lot of times the first thing happens is the momentum stocks go. And obviously what happened was biotech got absolutely torpedoed, okay? And then you start seeing other stocks kind of follow suit. And then there's a bit of a, a rush or a flight to safety to so-called defensive issues. And I think we're seeing a little bit of, of that now. And I don't want to – keep building my case and building my case because what is is if the market does go on the new highs then obviously the market's making new highs and we're just going to follow along let me see if i can find that graphic for you real quick or just punch in the search bar let's see if his rats and that's one thing that's kind of fascinating um Gary Anderson, I hope he has his name, his name right, and, and also Mike Moody have done a lot of relative strength type of analysis. And, uh, again, I think I've said a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I, I have yet to read Gary's book, but he gave like a kind of a blow-me-away type of speech a few years ago at one of our meetings. And uh, very well-thought analysis, a little bit more complex than I usually get into, but his relative strengths showed how the, you had, he had like a scattergram where the relative strength goes when the market begins to turn. And it's kind of like, you know, my simple way of doing it, like if the market's going down, if you got SS sheep dip, the rats begin to leave the ship. Well, you have these small cap, more speculative issues. Those are usually the first to go. And what's kind of interesting is people come back to those once the market takes a little bit. But before I digress too far, then the large cap stocks start getting hit. And there's a bit of a flight to safety into these defensive issues, okay? First, large cap stocks kind of hang in there or sometimes even go higher. And then these defensive issues begin to do really well. And then eventually everything sinks, okay? And if you go back and look at 2009, I'm sorry, 2008, as I wrote in a layman's guide to trading stocks, by mid-year – Nearly all stocks were down about 50%. And those stocks that were outperforming the market at mid-year on a relative basis were actually down significantly more earlier in the year. So there's not always a bull market somewhere. But right now, yes, these defensive issues are looking okay, such as the food stocks. Now, one thing, as I begin to pick this chart apart, one thing I'm looking, I'm seeing here, I'm seeing a little bit of a deceleration in trend. But, damn, it looks like it's going straight up. I hear you. But if you zoom in a little bit, you can see that it looks like it's losing a little bit of momentum, okay? Because, looks right here, you got a line that does this. That looks pretty good. But then right here, you got a line that does that, okay? So you got to be careful and not get too excited because at first glance, it looks like it's going straight up. Now, it might still be viable on a pullback. So if it does pull back, we'll see what happens, okay? But I'm seeing 17 bucks a share and then now 18 bucks a share over about a month or so. That's not a huge move. It's what, one, one point move higher? So I'd be a little nervous about that one. 
but it's not bad. Okay, it's it's better than anything you could probably find in this market at this particular time. Most anything. Uh, uh, let's see. Fix. Uh, no, because uh, you know this is a teachable moment. Somebody go get Alex. Uh, <laughs> Dave, why can't you just let it go? It's just not my nature. I like to beat the dead horse. I'm sorry. Uh, it drives my wife nuts, which is a short trip. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, a couple and a half months of sideways movement. Uh, no, okay? You know, that's a case where you back the chart way out, and, hey, Dave, looks like it's going up. But yeah, I hear you. But, you know, you got to take a what have you done for me lately, a bit of a Janet Jackson approach when it comes to markets. And this thing is going sideways for three months at least. So I'd be careful, at least two months, I should say. Pamela says, yeah. The problem is I don't remember <laughs> what I was talking about. Laugh out loud. Thank you. One person gets it. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, all right, J-Dug. J-Nug. Is that it? J-Nug. JNUG? Is that a stock? I don't have my glasses on me. I can't read that. Junior, Junior, you're talking about Junior Gold Miners? Poor Marcy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's the brother of my jokes. I did, uh, I used her, nobody, nobody ratted me out, but I had, um, I used her in my, in my uh, speech last week. I forget what you call them. Gold Miners? Junior Golds? Uh, J Nug. Why could? Why wouldn't that come up? Uh, yeah, these look okay. Uh, you know, here's the problem: it's three time leverage, so I'd avoid this. These like the plague. I did. I did meet a very nice lady um, in um, in Vegas, and she's more of a day trader. She's trading triple leverage things. But I told her, I said, "Well, you're not holding longer terms." She goes, "No, no, 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 no. I'm just day trading." She's smarter than that. To know the hold them, your um, these triple leverage things have abysmal tracker errors longer term because of the leverage involved, and also if you're trying to position trade something that's triple leverage, then just by the nature of being triple leverage, you have to trade one third of the amount. You see how that all kind of washes out. So don't trade them unless you're going to day trade them. Now, with that said, let's take a look at the charts, okay? Because that's why we're here, right? Uh, yeah, if this was some other chart other than triple leverage, I would agree with you, uh, especially because it's commodity related. You've got a bottom, you got a bow tie, you got a pullback. This looks like a pretty serious bottom is in place, okay? And as you know, I'm still bullish on those metals and mining, okay? So, yeah, Don wants to know about FB, which is Facebook. But, yeah, don't rush out and trade them. No, Don. Don's like the the hunter that goes out and hunts bears and the bear keeps tapping him on the shoulder and having his way with him. I think he likes the abuse. <laughs> Don, where was it back in June and where is it now? Same place. No, that's not a tradable uh that's not a tradable trend. Okay, yeah, it came back from 70, but that's not tradable. At least not in my way, okay. 3-day limit is my Route. Yeah, even three days can be a little dangerous in those things, but I hear you. You know, if it works for you, then you use it. Uh, absolutely. Not my way, highway. Is there a special price range of stocks that you prefer to trade? Uh, bars, it all depends. I mean, take a look at like UAL. I mean, that was now I do like shorts at higher levels, but UAL was 60 something dollars a share when we shorted it. And then if you go back and look at those uh, stocks I just showed, some of those were we're in the low single digits. So it all depends on the market. Like right now, for instance, I used to never trade a stock below 10 or 15 bucks a share. Well, then I went through a bear market or two and then realized that, well, sometimes even even good quote unquote stocks get beaten up. And sometimes I have what I call my Phoenix pattern. Um, I think Dick Fruth calls it the tombstone pattern. He wrote a good book on uh, uh, stock trading. And, um, I helped him early on in the process. That's why that's why I know the book uh, Parabolic Growth and Stock Trends or something like that. Uh, you can get it off Amazon. Uh, it's a little book, short reading, uh, good good book. And uh, he's an interesting fellow. But anyway, uh, my, I call it my Phoenix strategy. It's very similar to his um, what he calls Tombstone strategy. 
where these stocks just kind of go and bottom out. So sometimes those stocks could be down into the low single digits and still be viable. I used to never trade stocks that were that low, but I guess it's like never say never. If you go back and look at presentations I did 10 years ago, you probably, or whatever, 15 years ago now, or 20, you'd be like, oh, Dave said don't trade low price stocks. No, I'm okay with low price stocks as long as the volume's there and the pattern's there. Not the volume as a predictor of price, but the volume as a predictor of liquidity. If it has enough volume to make it liquid, even if it's lower price, I think it's worth a shot. Okay, And sometimes those lower price stocks can be more uh, inefficient. So it all depends on market conditions. If we enter a market where mostly big cap stocks are setting up and nothing else, we'll probably be trading those begrudgingly. But those will likely be at probably a little bit higher price levels than some of these um, smaller ones. David's been waiting patiently for Uma. How does Uma look? Uh, well, at first glance, not too good, but let's let's zoom in a little bit. Oops, wrong way. Yeah, it looks okay. Um, you've had a little thrust from lows, a little pullback. I'm going to give that an okay. Um, it does have some bad memories, but not horribly bad. Sometimes with an IPO like this, uh, you could overcome – some of those bad memories a little bit more easily. Um, those are just like people that have sold it away down, trying to get whole. Not enough time to get into all that, but uh, I don't worry about it as much, but it's still a concern. I think it looks okay. Uh, volume is a little bit thin, although I will trade thinner IPOs sometimes. XLY, only S&P sector that not has a death cross yet. All right, good point, Howard. Let's take a look at that. XLY, let's get the death cross set up. We're going to add in a consumer discretionary. Well, that's uh, – what does that mean? I don't even know what that is. What type of stocks are in this? And then we'll add in a 50-day. At first, I thought that was like um, one of those commodity sectors. Okay, I hear you. Yeah, the 50 is certainly above the 200, but it had a pretty big spill in here, though. <laughs> that's See, that's the thing. You can't sit around and wait for a moving average, okay, to cross over before you take action. But I would imagine nearly all of the Morningstar – let's take a look at the major bigs. Uh, death cross, death cross. Oh, that will cross back up. That's real estate. Defense, hardware, death cross, electronics or semis, death cross. Well, software never did crossover, okay? So that's another one. Drugs uh, just made the death cross. Look at that, okay? Health services, not quite, but I think they're going to make it. I think it's going to happen. Manufacturing, death cross. Material construction, death cross. Legion, Legion didn't make a death cross, okay? I wouldn't run out and buy them, though. Media, death cross. Telecom. Retail has it, so that's another sector. Especially retail has. Let's see what else. Internet has. Wholesale, yes. Diversified services, not yet. Utilities, yes. Although utilities have been improving as of late. Looks like they could cross right back over. Uh, the Rusty, of course. Chemicals, yes. Transportation, yes. Energy's a long time ago, but now energy's, as I've been saying, looking pretty good. We I mean, look at the death cross there. What else? Metals and mining, they're below it. They crossed over a long time ago, 2014. But they're looking pretty good shorter term. Conglomerates, yes. Durables, yes, but now they're coming back up. Non-durables, yes, but then it's crossed back up. Automotive, yes. Tobacco, nope. Foods, nope. Came close. Came down to do a little kiss. And then finally, banks, obviously, yes. All right, so we just bang those out really quick. All right, Amazon, thanks for you guys for waiting patiently. We'll get to those. We'll start banging them out now. I'll try to stay focused. Um, no, because you had this big one day. It was one day event, came all the way back in, and now you kind of crawled back up. So there's really no structure there for me to trade. Okay, Susan, uh, thanks for waiting patiently. I, why are, that's a pirate's favorite stock. Arr! Makes me wonder. IYR, XLU, and what does it make you wonder? XLP. So consumer staples, real estate, and what was the IYR? I forget. Real estate 
staples, and utilities. Yeah, those areas are doing doing okay. Okay, I'm not sure those areas you want to rush out and trade. Uh, they kind of hint of interest rate sensitive areas that are doing okay. You take a look at bonds, and bonds are kind of going sideways in here. So maybe they've stabilized. Okay, you're welcome, David. What about gold, silver, and crude? All right. Well, crude, we're long. I'm still a bull in crude, but obviously it hasn't done anything lately. Gold is shaping up. I'm bullish in the metals and mining. Lots of overhead supply to deal with, but so far so good. Uh, take a look at like the moving averages there. Take a look at like a weekly chart. Let's take a look at a weekly chart. Uh, kind of bottoming out even on a weekly chart. Big picture bottom. So gold's looking pretty good. Silver's actually set up. I had it on my Landry list yesterday as a setup. You can see... You've kind of got a sloppy bow tie, but you've got a bottom here, but a lot of trading back here. So I wouldn't rush out and buy the commodities themselves, but I do like the stocks still. GPN for Steve. GPN or CPN? GPN. Okay, there it is. Uh, it's already triggered if you're if you're getting along on this one. Um you had the thrust higher. You had the pullback. The pullback could have been a little deeper based on this big breakout it had, and that's one reason why I didn't go after it. Uh, but certainly you could do a lot worse given this market, but it's going to have to keep uh, headed higher for me to get excited. Hey, Don's here. He wants to know about F. Well, F is working his way higher, but it's nothing tradable for me there. Uh, it tends to be all over the place, and it's just not a tradable stock, at least at this juncture. GDXJ, didn't we talk about that already, Craig? That's the juniors. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, these these are the unleveraged. Yeah, yeah. If you go to trade them, then absolutely go after the juniors uh, and not to leverage juniors. Uh, kind of bow tie-y, kind of first thrust, kind of cup and handle. It looks fantastic. A little bit of overhead supply, though. That's the only thing that's got me a little nervous about that, but not bad. Yeah, that was my point. I agree with you. Susan wants to know about VXX. Susan, your name sounds familiar. Have we met? Um, well, I don't think there's anything to gleam here. Uh, this is the VIX. It, it, this is going to be a, uh, a mean reversion kind of market. This is also VIX short-term future. So you got to really understand what's what's uh, what's the word, contango, or there's something that happens here with the, the contract ending and decay. And it, it's a very complex world. This is a derivative on top of a derivative. So it's uh, I would stay away from something like this unless you really know what you're doing. Only in your dreams. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll take that. <laughs> Man, now you got me wondering, you know. God, I hope in the middle of the night tonight I don't start saying, Susan, Marcy's going to be mad. Thanks for your info. We thought it's FCX. FCX is generally bottomed out. Uh, that's going to be Freeport Mac Moron. Um, I think it looks okay. You've got a, a bit of a cup and handle. You've got a bow tie, a little pullback. A little too many days in the pullback for my taste, but, hey, it looks pretty good. And then you're going to have a little bit of overhead supply at 18. For all of these reasons, I haven't put it on my actual service, but I have it showing it in the Landry list for, yeah, a swing trade from 12 to 18. Absolutely. I think it looks pretty good, but I kind of pick it apart if I want to. Uh, okay. E and R for Andre. And I'll try to get to some of you guys I haven't gotten to yet. Uh, yeah, this looks okay. It's breaking out in here. It's already come back in a little bit, but it would have to keep breaking out for me to get excited. Oops. And then uh, pull back. But, yeah, absolutely put that on your radar. In fact, that will go into, if it's not already in there, that's going to go into my momentum list tonight based on today's action, okay, as a stock to watch. But I wouldn't buy it or, or take any action uh, just yet on that one. What do you think about OAS? OAS I'm going to like. That's going to be an all-service stock. Um, as you can see, I already have it drawn in, though. you got some overhead supply. All those things, kind of like the gold stock earlier, nice little bottom, nice first thrust, a few too many days in the pullback, everything I just said, rewind the tape, uh, but too much overhead supply on that one. But good eye, Abs absolutely good eye on that one, okay? I can't stop thinking about Susan now. <laughs> oh, that's funny. 
Uh, RSX is Russia uh, doing pretty good in spite of the world of it. Isn't like Russia going to war with the world. Um, shorter term, it looks okay. Longer term, if I were trading a transition like this, I'd prefer it off of the lows back here. But it, it doesn't look bad, okay? You're going to have some overhead supply to deal with. Um, it looks okay. I, I'm having a hard time getting excited about it. A little wide and loose, but uh, probably the moving averages there. Yeah, you bow ties there, you pull back. I can't argue with it too much, but um, just personally, it's not something I would probably go after. Okay, how about ATVI for David? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think this is also on my momentum list. Uh, and if it's not, it needs to be after today. Um, you know, the only thing that scares me a little bit, and it's a little counterintuitive, but the bigger they are, the harder they will fall if the market begins to roll over. Not that I wouldn't ever trade a stock that looks like this in a bit of a questionable sideways sort of market, but it would have me a little bit nervous because it's had such a good run. But, yeah, you know, as a trend follower, this thing begins to pull back a little bit. Um, I probably couldn't argue with it too much. I remember the old uh, Atari. Act. I remember when Activision started making games for, for Atari, and that was a big deal. Show my age here. Thanks again. Oh, you're welcome, Lars. I appreciate that. CPG, bow tie for long for Dave. Dave? Uh, yeah, that'll work. Uh, I think there's a lot of other oil service stocks you might want to look at. That's a driller. Uh, quite a few days of the pullback, so I might pass on it based on that, but they're all kind of pulling back quite a bit. Uh, just a lot of overhead supply to deal with. So see if you can find something that's got a little bit clearer overhead. But yeah, good eye on that one, Dave. VWAP volume useful. Well, VWAP is only useful, um... And I hate when people say, in my opinion, you know, what, what does that mean? If you're talking, it's your opinion, right? Because I am i can't give the opinion of others. But uh, VWAP, to me, is only useful if you are uh, day trading. I'm not sure if it's useful uh, elsewhere. Uh, Susan, from now on, uh, put one symbol on a line and hit return so I keep it straight. But I'll go ahead and knock those out. Uh, this is too wide and loose. This is more of a, I guess it's more like a convenience store than it is a, a refiner. Um, I don't know if they have refiners or not, but it's just, it looks like it's rolling over, if anything. Uh, keep in mind, I think refiners go down when oil goes up because it's cost of goods sold. That's my MBA sneaking out on me. So now would be the time to, to buy energy stocks. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, you've got a bow tie here, but let's back the chart out a little bit. I think at this juncture... It's kind of rolled over longer term, but shorter term, I see a bottom. I think at this juncture, uh, you would be better off going after some of those little oil stocks we talked about earlier and try to find some without overhead supply. Okay, TLP? TLP. Uh, yeah, I'd be more excited about something like this that's at lower levels. Now, look at the volume on here. There's no volume to speak of, so this would be a little too dangerous to uh, to trade. Okay, As a private trader, you can do it. Just realize the nature of the beast. But as a general statement or for educational purposes, which this is all for educational purposes, right, Alex? Um, there we go again. Uh, I do like a stock that would look like this as opposed to some of those at higher levels that are kind of bottoming out at higher levels. I prefer something longer term sold out that has a lot longer to go. Wow, this hour and a half went by really quick. Uh, I have a blast doing these shows, as you can tell. So thank you guys and girls for showing up. I appreciate the. Uh, uh, you being here uh, and taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So thank you so much. Uh, any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Landry .com. And if you, anything you want, anything that takes uh, thought, a lot of thought, I should say, I'll be happy to uh, cover next week's show. So let me know if you have some topics on that. Uh, Susan's going to dream of me tonight. Well, thank you, Susan. I was trying to get you out of my head and now you're back in my head. <laughs> yeah, I could see uh, tonight. I'd be like, Susan, I'll be in all kind of trouble. All right. Uh, we could all talk about Alex now. Okay. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate it. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, you know, you guys mean so much to me. Uh, thank you, Don. I appreciate that, too. Uh, thanks again for coming. And everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, and again, just shoot me an email if you got any questions. Thank you so much.